So if you don't know this about me, I'm a huge Seattle Seahawks fan. And I did not expect the season to go the way that it went. And I'm, I'm thankful for making the playoffs and all that. But if you were to look at me at the beginning of the season and say, Toby, what do you, how do you think the Seahawks are going to do this year? How do you, who do, who, how do you think they're going to play, perform, all of that? I would have looked at you and I would, have, I would have honestly tried to be like positive and come out with this like, you know, I think they'll be okay. But deep down, I, I was feeling this season is not going to be very good. It's probably going to be terrible. We traded away our Hall of Fame quarterback for draft picks and some unproven players. And, and I, I, wasn't, I wasn't super optimistic. But yesterday... They played in their first, the first playoff game of 2023, and even though they lost, they had a good first half, and uh, overall, this whole season has been players exceeding expectations. Many analysts, sports people would, would have said, the Seahawks are not going to make the playoffs, they're not even going to come close, and they've had many players play way better, and they've had rookies step up in beautiful ways to where, as I reflect on this season, as, as a Seahawks fan, I, I'm grateful for something better because I wanted them to keep their quarterback. I wanted them to do what they were doing and continue because and, in my mind, that was their best opportunity to keep moving forward. But I'm grateful for something better because they have a solid team now with players rising up and hope for the future with those draft picks. I'm grateful for something better. Have you ever been grateful for something better? I want to encourage you to think about a time in your life where you had expectations exceeded or um, you went into it with maybe it was a job or maybe it was an experience with family or an experience where you're like, I am scared, but after you went through it, it was actually better. Like, have you had one of those experiences? Take a, take a moment and, and look back on it and was that some, like, was the outcome something that you had originally wanted or even expected? but wasn't it better? It was better at the end. Last week, Mike opened up the book of Matthew for us and introduced us to the keys to the kingdom and how the kingdom of God is here and is with us, it is for us, we have it. And today we're gonna be diving into Matthew 1 and seeing Matthew open, uh, give this big introduction to the Jesus, Jesus, the savior of the world, he is here and he is with us. The kingdom is here, the keys of the kingdom is here, and it's how God personally revealed himself to mankind, the, the start of the, of, the, of the narrative. And as we dive into it today, we're gonna to see that Jesus, being this Messiah, was not what the people we came to were expecting, not even what they were necessarily wanting. And we're going to see that for those who did understand, however, and as we understand who Jesus is and what the implications of him being the Savior, the Messiah, I think we're going to be grateful for something better too. And it's going to be better than we could ever have imagined. Now, the book of Matthew, before we dive into it, just to give some like guardrails and context, but just as we did with the book of James when we went over that this summer, is... Uh, it's written to a particular audience, written for a particular purpose. And so the book of Matthew was written by Matthew, who was one of the apostles of Jesus, which were one of the 12 guys that Jesus called to walk with them, do life with them. They were the closest people to Jesus that he appointed to be the leaders of his church. Um, and Matthew was one of those guys. And this book, this letter that he wrote, like any book of the Bible, has a particular purpose. And Matthew's purpose was to show his fellow Jews, his fellow Israelite people, that Jesus is the Savior that they've been waiting for. And to give some context for that, the whole Old Testament, the whole Hebrew scriptures for the Jewish people um, promised this Messiah, this figure, the Savior, God himself who would come and bring God's kingdom to earth establish God's reign, eternal reign forever, and bring peace and justice and prosperity. And it was, it's what the Jews who are waiting up until Jesus and the Jews who don't believe in Jesus, what they're still expecting, what they're still waiting for is this Messiah figure. And so what Matthew is trying to do is say, this is your Messiah, he has come. And so as we go through the book of Matthew, we're going to enter into the world of the Jews and into the context of what, what is Matthew trying to communicate to his people. And as we see what he's trying to communicate to his people, we'll see that 
He's communicating it to us too because what he's telling to his people is telling them who Jesus is and it applies to us today too. And as we see who the Messiah, that this Messiah is for us too, it's gonna, it's gonna transform us. So let's pray and then we're gonna actually dive into the, the scriptures together. Jesus, I thank you for your word. I thank you that you have come near to us, that you are a person that we can know and that you yeah, that you've drawn near to us, God. And I pray, I praise you that you chose Matthew and that Matthew has recorded these words for our encouragement thousands of years later because we can still know you today. And I pray that as we look at your word and look at what Matthew is trying to say, that you would give us ears to hear and hearts to receive what you have for us today. And just thank you, God, for your presence with us. It's in your name, Jesus. Amen. All righty. Let's dive in. Uh, so as I said, Matthew chapter 1 is Matthew's opening introduction. It's his first words to his audience. And it's, once again, to declare that Jesus is their Messiah. And he has two sections in this chapter that uh, he uses to introduce Jesus. And that's a genealogy, which is like a family tree. And then the birth narrative of Jesus, which KJ read. And we're, we're going to move on from Christmas, even though we've been in Christmas for a couple of weeks now and we're still talking about the birth story, like we're going to move on. But it's, it's Matthew's way of telling us who this Savior is. So uh, let's start with the genealogy. And uh, so if you have your Bibles, let's open up to Matthew 1.1. 1, 1. And I'll start in verse 1 and then just give us some, uh, I'm going to highlight different sections of chapter 1 for us today. So Matthew 1.1. 1, 1 says, this is the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Let's pause right there, right away, because Matthew immediately drops two, the two most important names for the Hebrew people, Abraham and David, and he's going to show us that Jesus is connected to them. And what's important about those two names is Abraham, first and foremost, was the start of it all for the, for the Jewish nation. He, from him, descended the Israelite nation, and God called him and invited him to follow him, and, and God made this promise to Abraham that was, through you will come a blessing that'll be for all nations, for all the people, and it'll be through you. And so the Jewish people throughout their history held on to that promise of, through us, God is going to bring a blessing. And then he drops the name David, and David was Israel's greatest king at the greatest height of their ancient empire. The, the biggest, their biggest glory in all of that was, was King David at the helm. And along with being like a man, of, of, out of, a man after God's heart and so many other stories of David, what the Israelite people held on to with him was this promise that through him would, would come a ruler. Through his line would come a ruler that would be king over Israel and king over the world and bring God's kingdom to earth with prosperity and peace and justice and restoration. And it was the hope of the Jews that their God would be with them eternally and reign forever. And so Matthew would need to establish that Jesus is connected to these two dudes right away for his audience to uh, keep reading the story if if Jesus wasn't associated with them, he would, why would they keep, he, he couldn't be their Messiah. And so Matthew starts here to show Jesus is, he's of Abraham, he's of David. If you read through the whole genealogy, there's a lot of names, a lot of history that Matthew traces to show that Jesus is connected to them. And he, and he wants to show them that their Savior and their Messiah is here. But if you go even deeper into the genealogy, you're going to see many names and therefore stories that would have been associated with them and their, their culture and that, that the, his audience, the Jews, would see those names and instantly think of these people that, you wouldn't, uh, that they wouldn't have expected. Um, there's one of them, is, first of all, women are included, and back in that time frame, uh, it was a very... Uh, patriarchal, uh, male-dominated society, and genealogies most of the time back then, if not all the time, were this father had this son, who had this son, who had this son. So one, Matthew is, is and, and it would also be within like the kings and all those royal people and stuff like that too. And so uh, Matthew is not only including women, he's also, he also included non-Jews and people that would have been maybe not the proudest of people that uh, the Jews would look back and say, these are people that are a part of our history. And I think one, Matthew is giving dignity to women, to foreigners, to a bunch of awesome uh, people that weren't Jews as well. 
Uh, but if you look at some of those people as well, there's stories that are pretty dicey. Um, like, uh, I'll, I'll point out two, but I definitely encourage you to read through the whole genealogy and try to go back in the Old Testament and trace those names because it's, it's pretty awesome. But two, uh, two examples are Tamar. If you see, uh, Tamar uh, is the daughter-in-law of Jacob, who was a patriarch. Jacob was a descendant of Abraham. And Tamar had a son named Perez, who was a part of the line of Jesus. But how she gave birth to Perez is in this weird... Uh, tragic, sexually broken story where Tamar actually sleeps with her father-in-law, Jacob, to have this son. And and it's a weird story, but it's a part of the genealogy of our Savior, not something that you would have expected for the almighty, righteous king to come to the earth. And then if you move a little further down the genealogy, you see David, mighty King David, has a son named Solomon, but it's through the wife of Uriah, so not his wife. And he's, it's, the, it's a callback to the David and Bathsheba story, which is a story of a woman bathing on a roof. David sees her, brings her to him, commits adultery with her, and then tries to cover it up. And in his attempts to cover it up, ends up murdering Uriah, this, this mighty King David, who is the, the prominent, like through him, the king will come. And it's this real, another tragic sexually broken, weird story that ends in murder. And it would, if you look more into the genealogy, there's more stories of good and bad kings and more brokenness. There's also some positive things of, like it mentions Rahab, another uh, a foreigner who uh, welcomed some Jews and kind of allowed them to conquer a town and, and whatnot. But uh, there's a lot of stories in here that are, are broken. And I think what Matthew is trying to do is show us that the family tree of Jesus, the Savior, the Messiah that is here, isn't perfect. It's not picture perfect. And it even seems like Matthew's going out of his way to do this since he's going about a genealogy in the not normal way of uh, back then. And so what I think he's declaring in it is not only that Jesus is the Messiah, what he's not... uh, Oh, he's not only the Messiah, he's not only the Savior of the world, but he's also God's loving patience and plan of redemption that has lasted for thousands of years, that amidst all the brokenness, amidst all of the pain, like this is a story in need of redemption. Matthew wants to communicate that to us. But God's love, God's patience, Jesus still came. God knows the Israelite story. He knows all of what it was through and his plan of salvation endured all of that messiness because of his love and because he he wants to bring salvation. And what that means for us is that God also, God didn't condemn them. He also doesn't condemn us for our struggles. Even if you think back to your family tree and and the past of your family and things that may not not be perfect or ideal, like God doesn't condemn you. He doesn't condemn your family. His salvation is still for you. God's plan of salvation can endure our messiness. It can endure your messiness too. And that's the hope that Matthew's inviting us to just in this opening genealogy. And then he goes even deeper into this story of, okay, here's the Savior, here's the Messiah, and his plan of salvation is here for you. And it's, it can endure anything. And here's how he revealed himself to the world. And it gets even more unexpected because the king of the universe doesn't come to the world being born into a palace with pomp and circumstance, essentially like, I'm here, look at me, I'm the savior of the world, let's, let's, let's get going. No, he, he comes to a lowly family, is born in a lowly situation where the, the, Mary's pregnant, Joseph's gonna divorce her, but the angel, as we read, says, no, this is the salvation of God, it's here. But with that would have come, like with her being pregnant and not being his son, it would have, they would have been ostracized and, and kind of not, people wouldn't want to be associated with them, so they're removed from family, removed from people, and it's a lowly situation. And, and honestly, if it weren't for angels declaring to the shepherds or God uh, putting a star in the sky, orchestrating the constellations to lead the magi to Jesus, it, it would, I think it would have been very realistic for the savior of the world to be born to his parents and no one know about it at all, at all. It's pretty, pretty crazy to me. 
And, and Matthew makes the point of saying that all of this has taken place to fulfill prophecy, to fulfill things that have been promised to come. And he ends chapter one with this uh, quotation of a passage in Isaiah where the virgin shall conceive and give birth to a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. The culmination of chapter one is God is with us. And so if the genealogy sets the stage as to who Jesus is in terms of him being the savior of the world, him being the God that is for us, the salvation that is for us, that's endured thousands of years, the birth narrative shows us the heart of Jesus, which is gentle, humble, and meeting us where we are at. Uh, there's a passage in Philippians chapter two that I'll just read that captures this, this whole dynamic beautifully. It says, Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Once again, the king of the universe, the savior of the world, and his revelation to us, to, he chose to become like one of us, but not as this king in this, this uh, palace that everyone would see and be like, this, yeah, this is the savior of the world, and he's, he's the talk of the town, all of these things. He, he chose to become a lowly baby in a lowly situation in a lowly town. Because if, if he was born in the palace, he wouldn't have been able to relate to the lowly of people. He would have been removed, I'm sure. I would assume the Pharisees would have kept him away from the people that would have been unclean and, and things like that. Whereas Jesus drew near in the lowest way to the lowest situation to where he could relate to anyone in any situation. It's beautiful. But that wasn't what his people expected. So some history during the time frame leading up to Jesus and while Jesus was on the earth, the Jews were under Roman occupation, and it was oppressive. It was violent, it was not good. Heavy taxed, heavily uh, beat, and couldn't really stand up to anything, and it was, it was a really bad situation. And so the Jewish understanding of the Messiah that was built off particular passages in the Old Testament of like this conquering king that would establish God's kingdom, they took that and their frame of the Messiah was someone who would come, defeat the Romans, take back Israel's kingdom by force, and establish God's kingdom in this violent and conquering way. In other words, to destroy the mess around them. But Jesus didn't do that. He met his people as a lowly baby and grew up among them. He didn't come to destroy the mess around them. He actually came to meet them where they were at in their own mess and their own brokenness and offer them hope and healing. And it wasn't what, that would have, what, what they expected. And what's even crazier is he's even gonna draw near to those Roman oppressors and those non-Jewish people and invite them into the same healing, the same restoration, and the same hope that he's inviting the Jewish people into. Arriving as a baby showed that God meets his people where they are at with gentleness and love. And Matthew's point to us is he's the same way today. God's love doesn't just endure our messiness as the genealogy showed us. He actually loves us where we are at right now and salvation is available for us where we are at right now. And God actually meets us where we are at right now. This chapter really functions as uh, both telling us who Jesus is in his heart and it's this blurb. If you've heard of a blurb, it's also called like a dust jacket. Um, it's the back cover of a book, which purpose is you read the back cover of the book to get interested, and then you open the book and get to experience all of the book's offering. And this is Matthew's blurb saying, the king of the world is here. The God of the universe is here. Salvation is here. God is literally with us. Keep reading to see what this, what this entails and what this means. And it's an invitation to keep moving forward because God is with us. Because hope is here, salvation is here, the salvation you've been longing for, the, the hope you've been waiting for, the peace that you are seeking is here. Jesus did come to confront evil. He did come to deal with sin. He did come to bring redemption, all of those things. He is here with the kingdom, the keys to the kingdom that are for us, but it is not in the way that his audience is expecting and he's setting the stage for more unexpectedness moving forward. 
because Jesus is going to heal. He's going to do miraculous things. He's going to teach. He's going to say things that uh, challenge the perspective of the people of his day, and they're going to get. They're going to challenge us too in our perspective. Like Jesus's words have a way of getting in our lives and getting in our hearts and inviting us to wholeness in ways that we don't even that we wouldn't expect. And we're even going to see people wrestle with in the narrative that Jesus is actually their Messiah. They're going to wrestle with that claim because he's going to do things that they don't expect. And once again, the Jews, salvation meant deliverance and conquering of Rome. But for Jesus, he wanted to meet his people where they are at and bring healing to them and their own brokenness and their own healing and make them people that are like himself. He comes with forgiveness and a different kind of hope than what they were hoping in. And that's why Matthew starts the way he does with this genealogy and birth story because, once again, people are going to be confused. And it's as if he's saying, yes, this, this may not be what you were looking for or what you were even wanting, but this is the Messiah. Lean into that. Lean into him. Lean into what he says because he is the Messiah. He is the salvation. He is the hope that, that we have been waiting for. So his declaration is that God, the Savior, the Messiah is here and he isn't here in pomp and circumstance to destroy Rome because he's here to meet us where we are at in our mess and need and invite us to his kingdom because God is with us. And now where it applies to to us, like I want to remind us, Matthew is, or teach us, Matthew is writing after Jesus had ascended. So he's writing to a group of people that couldn't physically see Jesus as if for Matthew to be like, look, there's Jesus Listen to him and follow him because Matthew's claim, and I think why he's writing this, is that Jesus is still with us. Jesus is still accessible. He is still knowable. Salvation is still here, and we're going we're gonna to see that, and you can experience that, and you can see that. And so that means for us today, thousands of years later, we can still see and know and receive the presence of Jesus and his salvation and teaching and all of that, which means for us, wholeness Hope, the presence of God, the guidance of God in every situation is available to us today. We have access to it. They don't have, like all those things, like the presence of God, knowing God, don't have to be abstract concepts that we have to fully wrap our heads around because if we have Jesus, if the presence of Jesus, it's a person that we can know and relate to and if we have that, we have salvation, we have God with us and that's enough. If you have God, you have, if you have Jesus, you have your salvation. And my encouragement to you is God is with you. He's with you today. He's for you today. And I'm not sure what each of you are, are facing, what you're going through, what you're expecting for this year. Um, if you're struggling with anything or sin or a burden that's going on. And, but I do know that we all have at least something, sometimes multiple things all at once. And in the midst of it, it isn't easy to always remember that God is with us, that God is for us. It can be easy to get weighed down by just the process being long and hard or the unknowns or the guilt and shame of, of brokenness and all of those things. It can be easy for us to expect the worst, to expect that we're alone and have to figure things out on our own, or for us to expect that love or that hope is the last thing that God would be looking at us with. But Matthew's encouragement to you is, no, there there is something better than that. Like, God is accessible. God is here. He's for you. Salvation is here. Not only does God endure your messiness and the burdens of this world that you carry, he actually loves you where you're at and is with you where you're at right now, which means that you are forgiven and loved by the Almighty God. That's base level, (laughs) base level, you are forgiven and you are loved. That wholeness is possible, healing is possible, thriving is possible for you. And the keys to the kingdom are yours. As Micah introduced that theme of we have all that God, all of God's presence, all of God's love, all of God's power and guidance are available to us and we have it. And practically, you can take that thing that you're facing, that you're expecting, that you're unsure of, and invite the presence of God into it, the guidance of God into it. We can ask, you can ask questions of what does God 
say about this? Or what, does, what, 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 what is God's heart in this for me? What is God's perspective in this for me? And we can seek that. You can seek that. That's the gift of God's presence with us. We can call on it in literally every situation and need we could find ourselves in. And I want to invite you to start with one thing. Just start with one thing that you're going through right now or that you're dealing with this week to invite God's presence into and ask, what does God say about this? What does God think about this? And, uh, and you'll see that God's salvation and leading is better than anything you could ever imagine. And he hears your prayers. He hears your hopes and your, and your desire to know him and desire to walk with him. But as Matthew has been setting the stage for unexpectedness, keep in mind that God's perspective is not always the same as yours. It's not always the same as mine. God will not always give you what you want or even what you're expecting. But what he does promise always is his love and his presence and his guidance for us. And his invitation for us is to trust that his leading and his perspective is better and brings us, to, better for us, better for those around us than we could ever imagine. And when you recognize that God is with you, when I recognize that God is with me, when we recognize that God is with us as a church, we're going to see as we read through the rest of Matthew that God is inviting us to bring, as his church, God with us to the world as we experience him ourselves. Because the world, is expect the world has many expectations, just like you and me, that they're alone, that this life isn't perfect, which it isn't perfect, but that this life is bad, that they're alone, that they figure it on their own when... Like, we have salvation. We have, it's in Jesus. We have it with us. And Jesus is inviting us to share that with the world around us. And so I want to invite you to journey with us as a church as we go through Matthew, to lean into the unexpectedness of what Jesus and his teachings have for us, and to know that as a church, we get to bring that to the world, and we get to discover God and his kingdom together and share it with the world. So... I'm going to pray. I'd like to invite the band back up to uh, lead us in a time of response. Today we're focusing on prayer and just want to invite you to uh, let these songs, let this space be an opportunity for you to pray and seek the Lord for uh, inviting his presence into areas of your life as well into the life of our church. So let's pray together. Jesus, we praise you and we thank you because you are with us and we declare you are with us. We have salvation, we have hope, we have truth and we have grace and love and so many beautiful things, God, that you have shown us and revealed to us. I pray that for uh, each of us as individuals, you'd help our hearts to receive and own that in deeper ways, um, especially moving forward and that um, you'd help us to share this love and this hope with those around us in our individual lives, but as well as at church in this community to bring hope and healing and life and laughter to a, a, a world searching for it. In your name, Jesus, amen.